please go ahead and use the, um, the, the comment section. Tap, type in a comment and it will get to us and we'll be sure to address as many questions as we can. Um, so Richard, we're talking about The Whistlers tonight, which is a film that I just thought was so charming and is so interesting and smart. And I loved seeing um, when we were programming it that some of the most enthusiastic writing about it came from you. And um, I, I, I think our audience will have been a mixture of people who know Purim Boy's work very well and people that this is their first film by his that they've seen. Um, so um, I so for people whose I feel I I expect that those experiences will be very different, um, but both very interesting. And I wonder if um, if you can. Uh, I think that this film is in some ways a. Um, there's another police film starring a lead character with the same name one of the same actors not playing the Christie character. He made a film um, a little over 10 years ago called Police Adjective. And that film is so different than this police film. Um, can you comment a little bit about uh, what's different and what's similar? Sure, you know, it's, it's funny because when, as, a, as a moviegoer, um, I kind of believe in having you know, pure and fresh experiences and never and generally feel that that it isn't necessary to have done an awful lot of homework and to have prepared by watching a director's previous uh, body of work in order to appreciate a film, which is to say it can help, but a film that isn't immediately appreciable, um, except with reference to previous work, um, you know, I consider that something of a problem, an aesthetic problem. Um, but this film is in some way both different aesthetically from Poor and Boyu's other films, including Police Adjective, and yet um, very tightly tied to his entire career thematically, um, which is one of the things that makes it such a fascinating film. Um, I mean, I think of Poor and Boyu, uh, Police Adjective, to start with Police Adjective, even the title of the film is a linguistic conundrum that is um, made clear in the course of, a, of the film. Um, it's a police story that does involve um, an investigation, but it also turns on, like literally it pivots on the dictionary. It's about the definition of words, the use of language. And there are extended scenes in which the protagonist, the younger officer and his wife, who's a literature professor, spend a tremendous amount of time discussing, um, you know, the definitions of words, the usage, the use of, the use of language. Um, it's tempting to say that Poram Boyu is a linguistic director, but I think that it goes further than that. I think Poram Boyu is essentially an epistemological director. Um, you know, his first feature, which we call here 1208 East of Bucharest, um, the Romanian title translates to, you know, was it there? Like, did it happen there or did it not happen there? And the subject is a revel an act of revolution uh, in late 1989, when the Ceausescu regime was being overthrown. Um, the film centers on a TV broadcast where people who were present then discuss what in fact happened in the small town where, where, the, where, where, the, where the broadcast was happening and where they lived at the time. Um, for the Whistlers, um, it's very much a movie about language. I mean, the whistling, I, I, I'm a, there are no spoilers, right? Everybody who we're talking with tonight has seen the film just now, is that right? Well, let's say that some people may be tuning in before they watch it. I think, um, I think most people have watched it, but some people may watch this later before they've seen it. So if there's a way to talk around it without major spoilers, that would be the best. Good, I'm, I'm good. Yeah, um, the whistling, Whistling is a language. The yes. subject of the film is a police officer played by Vlad Ivanov, who is a Romanian police officer working in Bucharest, who is sent for reasons that you will find out to one of the Canary Islands called La, La Gomera, where there's a local language in which letters and phonemes are replaced by whistling. And this language is being used by drug dealers with whom 
the officer is involved in order to avoid the surveillance that inevitably comes with conversations on cell phones. Um, so on one level, it's very much of a movie about, 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 about language, but it's worth pairing this film with another film of Paul Rambeau's called um, When Evening Falls on Bucharest or Metabolism. That's mm -hmm. the other film that's very much centered on the world of movies. Um, and if you look at Paul Rambeau's career, he stylistically, you would say he's a sort of, and it's a term I kind of hate, a sort of slow cinema practitioner. He tends to use very long takes in which long dialogue scenes or long observational scenes unfold very meticulously at over great periods of time in single shots. Metabolism is a film about the cinema. It's about a filmmaker, it's about an actress. It's also about the use of a camera in ways other than cinematic. I think it's um, just the way that Uncut Gems is, um, is a, um, Um, an internal and intestinal film. So um, <laughs> metabolism is a gastric film. Metabolism is a film about endoscopy as much as it's a film about 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 movie making. Um, so it's essentially about you know creating, movie. creating, <laughs> um, <laughs> creating images and what happens so like behind and let's say within the scenes. Um, this movie takes movies from the other end, so to speak, from the user's side of movie making. Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, this, is, this is very much a movie movie. Like it's a self-consciously winking movie. And it's not obvious from the beginning how much it winks. But by the time you get to the end of the movie, you will have caught a tremendous number of really hilarious and really overt references to movie history and to the paraphernalia, to the realm of cinema, to the artifice of cinema. The style of this film is different. If you planted a viewer in front of this film who had seen everything that Porumboyu had made before, Thematically, it meshes perfectly with his entire body of work, but stylistically, it's drastically different. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason why it's drastically different is that he's in effect quoting the kinds of movies that he you know, loves and is interested in, but does not make. The entire movie in a certain way is in quotations. Absolutely. Um, the, it, the references are so much fun, especially for a movie fan. I think it wouldn't be too much of a spoiler to talk about some of the, the references. I think, obviously, we talked about the whistling as a language, and there's a whistling callback in The Searchers. Is that right? Are they watching? They're watching The Searchers, and someone uh, for one of those perfect um, clandestine meetings in a movie theater, but in this one, she decides to stay. And watch the movie and then there's a meet uh, um uh there's a cinema uh, stage a set and one thing are there are there other references um that you were particularly delighted by that maybe even some of our our some viewers might not have caught on the first time psycho of course of course let's no no that might be a spoiler <laughs> <laughs> no, say no more. Right, well it's a it's a crime it's a crime movie so it should be no surprise that there's and you know one of the one of the crucial sets in the movie one of the crucial locations in the movie is a motel a remote motel mm. with a yes. lonely clerk <laughs> but I won't say more than that um it's very in any case um it comes in, in a in a rather brilliant way um but at the same time I think that the fact that it's a movie somewhat in quotation marks has thrown off some critics, including some really superb critics, um, who find this a rather coy and tricky crime film. Because at the first level, it is very much of a crime drama. In fact, I think it's a, a very brilliantly constructed crime drama. And if you 
didn't care about Oromboyu and Romanian cinema and epistemological cinema. I think that at the first level, as a cleverly constructed thriller, um, it works very well that way. Um, but it's very tricky. It's got lots of flash, well, you have to just figure out whether they're flashbacks or flash forwards. And there's a moment that I, I don't actually want to spoil, but let's say if you wanted a literal dramatic representation of the idea of a character's past catching up with him, that's what happens. At a certain moment in this film, the flashbacks and the flash forwards converge in a way that's, you know, in, to my mind, to a, you know, just to a, a, a viewer who's interested in being thrilled. I mean, I was jolted by it. Have you seen it once, Richard, or more than once? I saw it twice. And I saw it when it came out at the New York Film Festival and then recently. And was, how, um, did you find the, 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 um, the, chrono the chronology and these, the flashbacks and fast forward, did you find, I mean, obviously you always find new things in the second watch, but what, can you tell, tell me a little bit about, was it, um, was it extra thrilling for you on the second watch? Um, yeah, I think I did enjoy it more than, I mean, I loved it the first time, but the second time around where you actually see how well the pieces fit together. I mean, in a way, pieces fitting together are kind of pet peeve of mine. Um, you know, this is the, this is the, the televisual disease of um, serial plots that are constructed in such a way that they have to dovetail from episode to episode. And that dovetailing essentially ties directors you mix my metaphors, ties directors' eyes behind their backs. Um, but here it's entirely different. Here, um, the, the, the meshing is part of the idea. Here, the epistemological theme that, 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 that Poron Boyu has been pursuing throughout his career, here, I mean, one of the things that he's, he's obsessed with is Romanian history, is you know, how, you, how you learn about history how you understand history, the connection between personal history and grand history, the connection between experience and knowledge or the gap between what you believe to be your experience and what you may, may come to realize is your knowledge. Um, there's this wonderful film called uh, The Treasure where, you know, the way I think about it is, you know, his previous films, he uses language to excavate Romanian history. In The Treasure, he uses shovels to excavate Romanian history. Um, it's very much a film about, you know, physically digging and seeing what you find and realizing that the, you know, the discoveries, the physical objects have meanings that go far beyond what you immediately took them to imply. Um, In The Whistlers, the kind of the overarching question of a thriller is, is for me, like, he, like a, I hate to call it a metaphor, but a, you know, an artistic figure of like how history fits together, how the past and the present link, how a trace that you catch in the past echoes in the present, how something that's happening now um, has its meaning deeply buried in some previous event that if you were unaware of that previous event would make no sense whatsoever. Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm seeing the film unfold in the way that you're talking about. And, the real, and one of the reasons why I think his, 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 his let's say his, epistemo his epistemology shifts to the aesthetic here. In other words, why the reason why this movie about that those connections between past and present take place in the movie movie realm, in the realm of watching movies, thinking about movies, thinking cinematically, is that for him, aesthetic experience as such is the best model for that kind of understanding. In other words, that, 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 that you know, his movie making isn't merely a, an illustration of these ideas. It's actually the creation of these ideas and the enactment of these ideas. Now, when he makes a movie about Romanian history, it's not about Romanian history. He's actually doing that exploration in the present tense. And here, by means of you know, referring to the searchers and referring to Psycho and referring to a movie set, and for that matter, referring to the 
the tropes of thrillers, that's what the tropes of thrillers in general, whether visual or dramatic, he's essentially saying, this is how we figure stuff out. The reason we love movies in the first place is that they help us understand what more literal approaches to history, politics, identity, self, don't. That's very true. You know, I'm also very fascinated by the way he uses sound, in particular music especially. And in this film, he is able to play with it so much in ways that um, uh, he's, he's used before. There's the, the classic film technique. You know he's a real film fan because of the way he uses musical motifs, like the way that they come back and the way that they're displayed in different ways. Um, a character playing a song or humming a song or, um, or as soundtrack. And um, do, you have any, do you have anything, um, do you have any comments on the way he uses music in this film? Um, no, I think, I think you just said it. That's like, that's exactly <laughs> kind of, you know, it, one of the things that does happen with the music and I won't, is that, you know, the, the name of the, the name of the, the name of the motel is the opera motel. So opera is being heard there, but the music, you know, to use a term that I hate, it leaps back and forth between being diegetic and being, you know, ornamental or in a commentary. It moves from being inside the action, music that's a character in the film is listening to within the scene and the music that essentially becomes the equivalent of a score. Absolutely. And it, he uses it so, just so cleverly. I think people always use, um, uh, it's, it's um, I think you said that, you know, people can consider his films um, rise often a word that comes up the humor in his films in his technique is and in the language is 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 delightful um and in the in this there are new delights in the way I, this is maybe too general of a question but i'm you've written a lot about realism and in a film like you know you've talked about his long takes in previous films and this is the opposite of that and yet um, uh, this film is away from realism, very much so. But his other films um, have done these long takes, but have not, um, have somehow avoided traps of realism in their mundaneness and in the length. And, and I know we're talking about a different film, but I find that so fascinating that someone can go from uh, th these to totally different styles and yet avoid this place in between that we often think of as realism where it's, it's very fake but imitating realism in a sort of in-between place that is kind of nowhere. No, I agree with you, which is to say basically every other Romanian director except for Rodrigo. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, the, uh, oh my goodness. <laughs> um, the thing about Paul Boyu is so-called realism, and I see exactly what you mean, is that what, you know, one of the things I try not to do, although it's a trap that I fall into like anybody else every now and then, is not to think about such categories like realism strictly in technical terms, you know, in the sense that, you know, neither to fetishize nor to, um, to damn a particular technique. Um, so, you know, a movie like Police Adjective, well, it's realistic in the literal sense that, you know, the action that's being filmed is the stuff that the characters do. And, you know, there are no dream sequences and there are no fantasy sequences. And, you know, everything that happens in the film could, you know, could indeed happen in the streets of that town. Um, but what detaches it from itself, so to speak, what creates that distance is the idea. In other words, the ideas that, 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 the, that the movie works with turns it creates, I mean, to, you know, to borrow and distort Mary Douglas's wonderful phrase, it becomes a natural symbol. Absolutely. The reality becomes a natural symbol in Poor and Boyu's work. Um, I love that. And in this film, that process is a little more complex because the realism is a little more stylized. 
like it's a little more conspicuously artificial without being less real. That's because of its relationship to movies that people recognize, the more familiar tropes of cinematic construction. Ah, uh, interesting. I want to ask you something like the ending, about but the ending. One, I didn't mean to interrupt, but like it, realism, the ending. The ending I, is amazing. I don't want to spoil it, but <laughs> you know, does it have one ending or does it have two endings? Where where does the movie actually end? Uh, and yeah, it's and um, the the use of fantasy is so interesting. And this brings up the use of fantasy and also what you just said about cinema tropes. I think you mentioned that th this is him making films that he likes to watch, aren't necessarily the films in the past he's made, the films that are the films he loves. And I, okay, so here's something I, I, I'd like to ask you about. Richard, we have known each other for a long time and we first met each other when I talked to you about your book about Jean-Luc Godard and I brought up to you some things that I found, I love him, and yet I find some things in his work quite sexist. And you, um, and it had opened your eyes to that. I don't think you had seen that in his work. And in this film, and I will say that that's true of most cinema, most cinema by men, it's a little mm. sexist. A li there's little bits of sexism, especially films by, uh, heterosexual male directors. And in this film, there's a beautiful main character named Gilda, Gilda, and already that's cinema. It's, you know, back to the mm -hmm. Rita Hayworth film, Gilda. And she's like Gilda, the Rita Hayworth film. She's unreal. She's perfect. She's wonderful. And yet there's something, there's, there's a little bit of sexism in that character, yet it's, so accurate to a kind of cinema that it's almost documentary-like of that kind of role in the history of cinema, but yet it's a little bit sexist. And yet because her name is Gilda, I suppose it works. Like Rita Hayworth always said that people, you know, went to bed with, they went, they, that, that Gilda wasn't real. They went to bed with the character she played Gilda and they woke up with Rita Hayworth and were disappointed. So in some ways it makes sense. But did you, did you find things about this character? I mean, was this something that's an I'm seeing and that you, that you didn't see? Um, you know, I, I see it in one particular way. Um, there's a, you know, to be, to be blunt, um, there's a nude scene. Mm -hmm. And uh, and and Gilda is nude, and you know Christie's nude, but his body's not seen. Mm -hmm. um, you know this 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 this, Boyu brought this problem up in um, in Metabolism, where yes. the, the the story of the film is a director who's making a film and he wants the actress to play a nude scene, and that becomes a a subject of of, of contention between them. Um, you know, I think he's playing with a trope here. I think he knows exactly where this character, the femme fatale, fits into the framework of a movie like this. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Needless to say, she's a character with a great deal of agency. Mm -hmm. In fact, she has so much agency without her there's no movie mm -hmm. um, and she's not the only woman with a great deal of agency it's actually pretty interesting that there's a it's almost like this Hitchcockian dichotomy of <coughs> the police captain named Magda who you know Gilda has dark hair Magda has blonde hair um, you know she's a cold Hitchcockian blonde mm -hmm. the opposite of a femme fatale well, yeah. actually not true for Hitchcock, a femme fatale, but in, in this film, fatale in an altogether different way. Um, mm -hmm. And I, you know, one subject that you have written about and discussed at great, in great detail is the, the movie of the female, the movie of the female double, the twinned or paired females. This movie has it. Uh, uh, no spoilers, but this movie has it 
in an exemplary form. I know exactly the spoiler you want to talk about, and it's beautiful, and it's wonderful, and we encourage everyone who hasn't watched it yet to watch it, and if you've seen it, watch it again. But I think that the character of Gilda is, I wouldn't call her a femme fatale exactly. You could say that she is. She has some of those, some of the costume of a femme fatale, but without really that agency, that mystery, that... Um, but she does have agency as a character. I think it's more the way he films her body and um, and it's very subtle and and it's and she's wonderful, but it's a, she's very ornamental and in a way that is sort of hard to nail. Like you you know it when you see it, the a little bit of a difference between um it's it, it it's I I couldn't quite articulate articulate what it is about it, but I think you're right. He's he's reckoning with it. He's dealing with it in his last in the in and um, metabolism in the film you were talking about. It's very interesting because that film starts with a discussion of the nude scene, and then there's a sex scene that we don't see. And in this, there's a sex scene that you talked about where you see her nude and you don't see him. And they're doing it for the cameras, for the surveillance cameras, but for the cameras, and. I think he's obviously very aware of it. And, you know, he starts a film about the male director. And in this, there's a, you know, he's obviously has enough depth and humor to take the piss out of the director. There's a director in this film, or maybe he's a location scout. No, I think he's a director, isn't he's he? A direct, he's, a, he's a filmmaker, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and so well, he, he can take- he, claim, he claims to be a filmmaker. <laughs> Fair enough. It's just looking, <laughs> no, it's true. And he's just looking at beautiful locations. You know, that's so interesting. It really, um, it this film really plays with the like film as, um, you know, tourist board, tourism board, mm -hmm. you know, but in a wonderful, beautiful way. Like this is, it takes place in the Canary Islands and that film director character, the filmmaker is looking for locations and um, it really, it's, it's so, um, it's, it's, it's such a like a, a, it's such a beautiful film it's so it's like candy but very smart candy or something like that um, <laughs> there you go um, I, I wanted to um, we'll be we'll start to open up to questions so if you have a question please go ahead and raise your hand there's a raise hand button or type it into the Q&A box um, while you're thinking of your question, or if you're on YouTube, please send a comment and then the question will get to me. Um, but Richard, before we, uh, before I um, open it up to the to questions, I wanted to talk to you. We've been, this is our third of these uh, movie club discussions. And we have also in all of these talked about, you know, the first film that we watched um, was the director of Bakurao, and we talked about how his film suddenly went from theaters to online distribution. And he said, you know, talking about pluses and minuses, he said for him, it was all pluses. And, you know, we wouldn't have, he and I wouldn't have been able to have a Q&A for his film for Memphis and the wider public without the strange new world. And um, we've been talking to other people about how this new time in, in the age of COVID-19 and coronavirus has changed the way you are the goings on about town editor of the New Yorker. And right now, no one's going on about town at all. And so can you tell me a little bit about how that's changed your job, your relationship to movies, the, what you're covering? Well, one of the things that's interesting about goings on about town is that it you know, it has always been something of a paradox. I mean, long before COVID-19 and even long before, you know, streaming, the very section is something of a paradox because the New Yorker is called the New Yorker, but it's a national magazine. And, you know, with online distribution, it becomes a, a worldwide magazine. And yet the artistic events that we cover are all centered in New York. Um, for at least a decade, certainly since 2009 or so, um, I've been very consciously covering in the section movies that are 
available streaming, um, along with movies that are in theatrical release, on the grounds that um, you know, uh, even a you know a relatively unfamiliar international film or independent film that is streaming is instantly in wider release than you know something in three thousand multiplexes. It's playing on the same field of accessibility, so to speak, as the widest release movies, um, and therefore justifies its presence in in the section. Um, And certainly for the last few years, um, when movies are streaming, I take note of it in the section. And now the mix is simply shifted from a mix to, you know, 100 to zero. Um, so it's a shift, but it's not a complete turnaround. It's just moving things, you know, in one particular, you know, as far as possible in one particular direction, which will then, you know, shift back to a different proportion when movie theaters open. Um, the the real the real the real difference is the definition of an event. In other words, with openings, eventness defines itself. Even with revivals, eventness defines itself. Um, whereas now, um, because relatively few films are being released streaming. Um, in other mm -hmm. words, most of the major studio films, most of the major independent films, except for the ones that are already opened, most of the major international films, except for the ones that are already opened, are being held back. Mm -hmm. You know, I actually think that what's going on is that um, distributors basically just think that people aren't going to pay enough online to justify substituting it for theatrical release. Now, people might pay $5.99 or $6.99, but the price point of you know, $19.99 that might be charged for a new release online, even if a family of you know, two or three or four might pay a lot more than that to see a movie in theaters, the idea of paying $20 to see a movie at home, even for a family, I think a lot of people are not ready to do that, are not ready for that. And so studios are just gonna even, you know, sm and smaller distributors are just pushing things to later in the year and even to next year. Um, as a result, eventness changes. So, for instance, you know, in the in the in the issue that um, is out on newsstands now, um, one of the one of the series that I'd been looking forward to greatly was um, the second part of the Afrofuturism series at BAM revival series that Ashley Clark programmed. Um, so, uh, I was able to mention the fact that the series was supposed to happen and to discuss a documentary, a wonderful documentary about Sun Ra. Um, that relates to that series. You know, event, um, I Am Not a Witch is being released by the Criterion channel uh, this week. So that becomes an event. But by and large, what, what, the, what the shift to 100% streaming does is it essentially opens the field to movies that aren't events and that I think are worth bringing attention to for readers. I think, think that readers, you know, might enjoy watching um, now a wide range of things, whether you know whether it's um, Cinema Verite, that you know the wonderful film by Sari Springer Berman and Robert Polcini about the making of um, an American Family, a drama about it, or 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 Johnny O'Clock or Pain and Gain. <laughs> you wrote a wonderful list of movies on Netflix that are available, mm -hmm. and um, you've mentioned retrospective titles. Um, I think that right now, I mean, everything has changed so quickly. We have done some, we, um, I think you know we were about to open an art house cinema this month right now. And instead we're doing an art house cinema online and we're doing titles from, um, we did some, we did one retrospective title, which did Donna Flor and her two husbands, but I would love to do more retrospective titles, which haven't been quite I, I, I would love to see more retrospective titles available for streaming. Um, and I would like to screen those for our audiences. How are you, since this is a film, The Whistlers, which is about a movie about movies, how are you finding, where do you find some of the best sources to find old films? Um, it's okay if it's illegal, or you don't have well, to say it. If it's yeah, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm literally just thinking because, um, you know, the funny thing about streaming is, is 
on the one hand, it's, it's a cornucopia. And on the other hand, you know, I kind of feel with streaming the way I felt in the age of the video store. You know, we, we happen to live uh, near a, a great video store that just closed. It was in business for more than uh, 30 years, called uh, almost 40 years, called for 40 years, called the video room. And the video room was a real like cinema tech of a video store. But even so, I'd go in and I'd be overwhelmed by the options and yet say to myself, it has every movie except the one I'm looking for. <laughs> and that's even more true on streaming. Um, so, you know, you take what you can get. And at the same time, look, one of the reasons why I'm so agnostic about platforms, <coughs> which is to say one of the reasons why I'm perfectly happy to watch movies on my TV or on my computer, and I'm not frank, I mean, I love going to the movies, I love seeing things in theaters, but I guess I'm not, I'm not crestfallen to watch something at home. On the contrary, I like being able to drive. Um, is that I, for a long period of time, you know, I didn't have home video. I started watching movies in an era before home video and I would just go see movies, you know, three movies a day, the same movie, you know, 10 times in a week. Um, so I got a very strong, you know, inoculation of big screen time. Um, I don't know how we got onto the side. Oh, so I take them where I find them. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Netflix doesn't have a lot of older movies, but you know, I found a few things there that I was really happy to find. Amazon has some fine things. YouTube has some great things. Um, Criterion Channel is, you know, to my mind, the gold standard for classic movies, especially classic international movies. Um, wherever you're lucky enough to find something. Absolutely. Um, I think that uh, I, I want to open it up to questions. Um, please use the Q&A box or also, um, I think some of you are being shy. Um, I would love if some of the people on this call had a question about the Whistlers or it could be a question about in general to Richard. Um, feel free to raise your hand and I will call on you. Or um, who has a talk? Are you using the wrong? Okay. Um, what a shy bunch. I know that someone has a question. Is it because they can hide? Because I can't make eye contact with you? Let's you say. People hide, it emboldens them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Except in this, we actually can call on people, which is a nice, and they don't want to. They want to stay um, invisible. Um, okay, well, uh, um, well, let's talk, well, I'll start then. I've already asked all the questions, but I want to talk about the, the premise of the film is, um, as we've talked about, and it's about using whistling as a language. Mm -hmm. And um, it's uh, so, uh, it's, uh, that's, it's so smart and yet so elemental about what language is to do. And wasn't there also something about a whistling language in um, Miguel Gomez's Arabian Nights or just something about birds? Oh, bird, Maybe it wasn't about bird, whistling. Bird, right. Yeah. But, but I think you it, know, that now that we mentioned it, now that you mentioned it, you know, the, there's, some, there's the question in this movie, in, in The Whistlers, you know how to whistle, don't you? <laughs> That's <Yeah>. fine. <laughs> Howard Hawks. That's so funny. I didn't even catch and then, that. And then, if we're going to be even more Hawksian, uh huh, always the anytime. lesson. The lesson. So the guy who asks Christy, "Do you know how to whistle? Don't you?" And he shows him. You put your finger in your mouth. I don't even want to. Oh, but, Richard! I think we're getting R-rated here. <laughs> we're getting Hawksian. <laughs> That's so we're bringing funny. up baby. That's really getting to the root of hawks. That's so funny. Um, uh, yeah, and there's something also just basically about um, there's something so basic about um, about um, dialogue and films being. I mean, he's someone who's so obsessed with with breaking down what is language and what is dialogue and what are adjectives. And in this, it's like what is you know, when you watch a film in a language you don't understand, it's with, even without the subtitles, it's the sound, it's the rhythms. It's even if it's in a language you do understand. I've 
talked to you a lot about screwball comedy and it just becomes, and that's another Hawks thing. He would do the thing with the cushion dialogue that, you know, that it, it was okay to miss some of the dialogue because it, so much of it was about the rhythm and the sound. And this really just kind of breaks that down into a plot point. Well, I mean, first, it, it comes to language. Well, the Sorry. first line in this is, do you speak Spanish? All oh, right. Ah. The first line in this film is, do you speak Spanish? And the answer is no. And the question is English? Yes. So a Spanish guy and a Romanian guy speak English together. Absolutely. And I know. One of the things, and one of the things that, that the whistling is used for is to communicate. Like there's whistling in Romanian and whistling in Spanish. And Gilda is the character who knows both languages. So she receives a whistle in one language and communicates by whistling in another language so that the people who are speaking Spanish and don't speak Romanian or speak Romanian and don't speak Spanish can communicate. Oh yeah, that's another way that she has agency. That's true. That's she's the one, she's oh, the no only one who understands agency. everything. Yes. She, she's the only one who She's also, I mean, she's also the one who um, let's put it this way, decides whether the sex is real or not. Right. That to me is the main femme fatale characteristic. You know, That's true. was she having sex because she wants to have sex or was she having sex because it was a performance that was required for the sake of the criminal deception, the criminal plot? I'm not going to spoil to say which it is, but it is a plot point. She's the boss. Point well taken. That is very femme fatale. Absolutely. Okay. I did. So we have a question from Dylan and um, I will. So now Dylan, you are in the conversation and if you can unmute yourself, Dylan. Great. Hi, Dylan. Hi there. Thank you very much. I was actually typing my question, um, but I guess I can just kind of say it out loud. Um, first of all, I'm really, really glad you discussed the epistemological element of this film. The only other film I've seen of Porn Boyos is uh, Metabolism, When Evening Falls in Bucharest, but I haven't seen that. I only saw it when it came out, so about five or six years ago. But I was thinking more about what you were talking about, the the interest of filmmaking itself, the act of filmmaking, the, rea um, the, the epistemological nature of filmmaking itself. And you, you just mentioned it in terms of per like them performing sex in front of the surveillance cameras. But what I'm just curious, like, are there any other elements of, of performativity, of like performativity as like the focus of the film? Um, are there any other elements to that that you've picked up on or that you've kind of read more into? Oh, well, there's an awful lot of it actually. And I, I'm going to avoid spoilers, but there's an awful lot of it mm -hmm. because there are like, there's an awful lot of surveillance in this film. So, for instance, you know, a sex scene that's happening under the surveillance cameras of a police officer who's treating it like pornography. I mean, it's mm -hmm. unbelievably funny. Um, uh, inter police interrogations taking place in front of a one-way mirror or two-way mm -hmm. a, a, um, two mirror rather, where there's a question as to whether the interrogation is an actual interrogation or a staged routine. Mm -hmm. um, Dylan, is there a... Um... I think, you might the, I, think, I think the theme of performance, of deception, but that's, con I mean, the funny thing is that that's a constant in, in movies, no less than in life. In other words, any mm -hmm. thriller you watch is a game of people deceiving each other. The difference is that in this movie, people are deceiving each other under each other's gazes, like the, the, the observation and the interpretation of those deceptions is integrated into the action. Mm. That's, I, 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 only, I only watched it once last night, so I'm looking forward to a second viewing to kind of pick more up on those, um, uh, on, that, on that kind of reading, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dylan. Okay, so um, now we have a, um, we have, everyone became less shy in that moment. So um, let's see, there's a question. Um, Oh, here's a really interesting question from Molly. And 
from Molly Wexler, did you find any of the score to have whistling type music incorporated into it? I sensed that and found it brilliant. Um, yeah, the, 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 Uta Lemper, the Uta Lemper version of, um, of uh, Mac the Knife. Oh, that's right. That was, yeah, that was so beautiful. And then the, Molly also has a question. She said, I, finally, I love the scene at the beginning when they entered the tunnel and the credits played. Was that a reference to another famous film? That's a very good question. I was actually wondering the same thing and I I think it is and I'm not sure what. Actually, yeah. I don't think Godard does it, but not quite that way. Um, but I, I think it might be from a classic film noir that's skipping, that's polluting my memory. Mm, interesting. Maybe if someone else um, does did catch that reference, there's so many references, feel free to tweet at us or to write it in the comments on this YouTube. Um, if you're on YouTube um, or in the chat here. Here's another question um, uh, uh, from Sissy, um, Sissy Jankova. Hi, how do you feel about the current future appetite for foreign films for English speaking audiences in relationship to streaming in particular? Do films like this feel more digest digestible because of this genre? Um, oh, that, you know, that's something we didn't really talk about genre and uh, we didn't talk about the, uh, how much fun there is with genre. So is, is a Romanian film more digestible um, in this genre? And what do you think about uh, streaming films and accessibility? Well, um, I mean, I think we can judge by the prominence that this film is getting compared to Porum Boyu's other films. Although what's funny is that I think critically, um, you know, I actually think that a movie like Police Adjective got better reviews overall than this, precisely because um, this one, I don't know. I mean, I happen to hate the idea of genre, frankly. Um, for me, genre is a, a crutch for critics. And it's a, a, set of, a sort of a a consent where 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 they can you you know by means of knowing a great deal of movies in a particular genre by knowing a great deal of movies in other words the province of criticism you can you know condense that knowledge into a club with which you beat a new movie and that's what happens here that you know by dint of you know your 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 critical scholarship you um, not you and not me but some critics um, who find a movie like Police Adjective, you know, eminently acceptable because it's, um, let's say, straightforward genre-free realism that doesn't overtly refer to other movies. It's almost as if um, the Whistlers were somehow challenging and defying an accepted body of knowledge instead of conventions. And it's complicated. I mean, The Whistlers is a complicated movie. And, and you asked me if I watched it more than once, which is a really good question because it really does help. There's a lot going on. It's like watching a film by Alain René in a certain way. Mm -hmm. With the way it plays with time, especially, yeah. and the sort of cleverness. René used yeah. to write these, um, how do you, would you describe them? Almost scores for the way that the film played with time and and um, they really looked like score, like musical scores. And you're right, I, I, I'm looking forward to seeing it again. Um, well, yeah. I think the way that, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the releasability, so to speak, of a film, genre helps, but with critics, one never knows. It's so true. I think you're totally right, Police Adjective. His films that were, this film is, as we said, as I said, sort of, you know, his films that are less like candy were definitely more better reviewed <laughs> than this film, which got some mixed messages. And I mean, mixed reviews, not mixed Playfulness. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, I'm sorry. No, 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 please, go ahead, what were you saying? Playfulness, you know, the Playfulness, fact this movie absolutely refers to other movies and kind of yeah. winks at itself along the way. You know, there are people who are offended by this idea. They were offended by it, you know, in 1960 with Breathless and they're offended by it today with The Whistlers. The idea that something takes you outside the action and outside the drama and outside the immediate identification with character. 
um, it's very troubling to some critics in a way that it, I think is not troubling to viewers. I think, you know, Gil Perez wrote beautiful, the, in the, you know, the, the Gil Perez's um, last book, The Eloquent Screen um, Background, uh, Gil, Gilberto Perez was, was my professor in college, um, a brilliant critic and a brilliant professor and a wonderful man um, who died uh, a few years ago. And his, he had just completed a book about the rhetoric of film called The Eloquent Screen, which was published um, late last year. And it's very much centered on a subject that you and I have talked about a lot, namely melodrama. And one of the things that he emphasizes with melodrama is that by its very nature of, of, of excess, melodrama stands outside of itself. You know, that, that the very essence of, you know, the, the mistaken idea of constant identification with characters in a realistic space is a critical delusion that is antithetical both to the history of cinema and to this, the ordinary experience of watching movies. Nobody forgets that they're watching a movie. Only an insane person, only a clinically insane person forgets they're watching a movie. You're always inside and outside. Inside and outside is the essence of the medium, and the essence of the art. Um, but there's a critical habit of defining according to a fairly narrow set of rules, um, which by the way, brings us back to Poor and Boy's previous film, Infinite Football, which is the great film about rules and their effect on reality. Absolutely. A documentary about a brilliant crank who wants to change the rules of soccer in the belief that doing so will actually bring about something like grand scale political progress. Yes. Um, yeah. So we hope that our viewers will, uh, who haven't seen some of his other films will um, check out some of the films we mentioned. And, um, and as we mentioned, maybe this film is worth seeing again or um, if some of you are seeing this Q&A before you see the film, please see the film. I'm sure you're tempted to now. Um, I want to uh, thank you all for joining us and we'll be back. Uh, we'll be back next week at the same slot. Um, we've been really enjoying doing this conversations. And Richard, I, it's so nice to see you. It's so nice to talk about movies with you at any time. And thank you so much for joining us. No, I feel the same way. It's good to see you literally and it's good to talk with you. Absolutely. Well, thank you again. And so we'll say good night. And I hope some of you will um, tune back next week. And if you haven't watched um, some of our other films, we also have um, the, the, the Traitor, which is another uh, genre film. Richard hates genre, but I, I like it. <laughs> and maybe we'll talk more about genre next week. And um, I hope you're all well. Thanks again. Bye, Richard. Bye, Miriam. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.